add grain, match grain, and remove grain are all found under the noise and grain category. And they each do exactly what they say. Add grain is great for emulating film grain on top of footage. Match grain is great if you're adding graphics into footage that already has grain and you want it to have the same type of grain so that your graphics match the shot footage. And remove grain will attempt to clean up grain and remove it from the footage for a cleaner image. So let's start with ad grain. I have this clip of an astronaut robbing a bunch of thugs. Totally normal thing to happen in a dark garage, but I think we can make it a little bit grittier if we add some grain to it. So let's go to the beginning of the clip and add grain to it. Immediately, we're gonna see a white box in the center of the frame. This is the preview region. And the reason there is a preview mode is because this effect isn't all that fast, but I don't particularly like only seeing part of my image having the effect applied. So my first step is almost always to just change my view mode from preview to final output. And that way everything is getting the grain applied uniformly. By default, this doesn't look all that exciting. It is animated, but as you can see, it takes a bit of time to render. But this default setting really doesn't have much over the regular noise effect. So what you really wanna do is go to the presets and choose one of these. These are all designed to look like specific types of film. So if you know the type of film stock that you're trying to emulate, you can just choose one. I'm gonna choose this Kodak Vision and the grain profile updates. And just like that, I'm able to add a little bit more grittiness to my footage. This is without and with. And now with the YouTube compression, this might be really difficult to see. So you might wanna just throw this on top of some footage yourself to see what it does. But there are actually lots of controls, so let's walk through them. Underneath the preview region controls, if I switch this back to preview, we can change the position of that preview region as well as the width and height if you wanna speed up your render time and only preview a certain part of your image. You can also disable that outline view or change the box color. So it's very customizable. But that's it for the preview region. Our next viewing mode is the blending mat, and we'll get to that a little bit later. Let's go back to final output and then look at the tweaking section. This is where we can control, say, the intensity of the grain. If I increase that, then it's gonna become much more noticeable. Or if I dial it back a bit, then it won't be quite so intense. You can also change the size of the grain, which is a nice feature, as well as the softness. If I turn this down, it will get sharper. If I increase it, it'll get much softer. I'll reset both of those back to their defaults. And then we have aspect ratio. I could increase this to have a wider size grain. I'll make that a little more intense so it's easier to see. And this way you could match the aspect ratio of maybe anamorphic footage. Then we have channel intensities, so we can increase noise on just the red, green, or blue channels. Or let's say I don't like how much green there is, I could decrease the green grain only. As well as the channel size, I could individually control the grain for each one of these channels. So I could make the red larger grain and the blue smaller grain. Okay, I'm gonna reset this again, choose another preset. We'll say Eastman color high speed. Make sure to change this to final output. And I'll pan over to a brighter section of this footage. And I'll close up the tweaking section and, and now look into the color section. This is where I can change the grain from being color grain to just monochromatic. So it's only adjusting the brightness of the grain basically. I could turn this tint amount up or down. By default, it's set to white, so that doesn't really change anything, but if I chose a really bright magenta color, then my grain is going to be tinted that color. Now, it's not very intense. If I turn it off and back on, you can kind of see that the graininess that's being generated is tinted that color. Maybe if I change this to a green, it'll be a little bit more noticeable. There you go, you can see that a little bit better. And this works on both monochromatic and fully colored grain. With monochromatic unchecked, I can increase or decrease the saturation of that tint, as well as dial back the tint amount. Now I'm gonna leave that back at white and turn the saturation all the way down and up to show you that this also affects the grain. But turning that saturation all the way down is basically the same as turning it to be monochromatic. All right, let's reset that back to default. The next section is application, and this is how the grain is being applied to the image. By default, the blend mode is set to add, but I could change this to film, and this is going to simulate film grain a little bit more realistically. If you take a look at this bright area versus this darker area, especially right here, you'll notice that the grain is showing up a lot more in the darker areas and not quite as much in the brighter areas. That's how actual film would respond to grain and brightness values. We could change this to multiply, and then it's just a straight multiplication blend, now we're basically getting the opposite. Brighter areas are getting more grain than darker areas. If I put it back to what it was set to, add, then the entire image is getting it much more uniformly. Screen is going to be a less intense version of add, but it will brighten up the image. 
Then we have overlay, and this is going to make both the shadows and the highlights have less grain and apply more grain to just the mid-tones. So if realism is what you're going for, film is really what you want. Now we can adjust all of the grain settings very fine-tunedly with the shadows, mid-tones, highlights, and midpoints controls. If I turn the shadows down, we're going to get less grain in the shadows. If I turn it up on the highlights, we're going to get it more on the highlights. Just keep in mind that because we're using the blending mode of film, the most extreme brights are not going to be getting that grain. You could also do the same for the midtones, turn that up or down, as well as control the midpoint to determine how that grain is distributed across the entire image. Within this application, we also have individual controls for shadows, midtones, and highlights for all three color channels. So if I wanted more grain in the green channel for just the shadows, I could do that. It's extremely customizable. The next section is animation. So we can choose how fast this grain is animated when we play back. I could turn that speed all the way down to zero and then it's just going to be a grain overlay with no animation at all. Or I could change it to a value of say 0.5 and it won't animate quite as fast as at full speed. We also have this option for animating smoothly. By default, it's going to be a random noise pattern for every single frame of the footage. But if I say animate smoothly, then it's going to be much more like an evolution cycle animated on, say, a turbulent noise. Just a slightly different look. We could also change the random seed to have a completely unique frame. If you need to apply multiple instances of this effect to different layers and you want them to have unique starting points. And the last section is blend with original. Now this normally would just be an amount slider. So I could turn this all the way up to 100, which would allow me to basically just turn the opacity of this effect all the way down or up. But this section is much more complex and gives us a lot more controls for how to apply the grain to the image. And we can blend this in one of two ways, either color matching or by using a masking layer. If I go into the color matching, I can choose a specific color that I want to use as a mask or a blending mat. So I'm going to use my eyedropper and let's say choose this wall color right here. If I switch to my blending mat now, that section or that color is basically being keyed to generate this mat. So if I go back to my final output, I can now blend this grain with the original by using that selected color. If I turn my amount up to 100%, now that grain isn't showing up in the areas that that mat exists. And I can modify that mat by using the matching tolerance and matching softness. So if I switch again back to my blending mat and I turn up or down the matching tolerance, I can be a little bit more precise with what I do or don't want to have the grain applied. I could also blur it out a little bit to make it softer and not so chunky. I could even invert that match if I wanted the grain to be applied to that section and nothing else. So let's go back to our final output and see that now that grain is only showing up on top of that area. Now I don't have to be so extreme with my amount. I could turn this back so that there is just more grain applied to that or if I invert this, less grain applied to that section. We don't have to go to the extreme of 100 or zero. I could also blur out the mat, which is similar to the matching softness if I turn this back to blend mat, but it's actually applying a blur to the mat just to make everything softer. I could also match the color using one of any of these types of modes. It doesn't just have to be RGB. It could also be just the hue, chroma, luminance, red, green, or blue channel. So lots and lots of possibilities for customization. But I could also turn that off and not use color matching and instead use a masking layer. This can be any layer in my composition. So I'm just going to bring my logo out and I don't even need to see it. I'll just hide that layer and then go in to my mask layer and choose my logo. Now, if I switch back to my blending mat, we'll be able to see my logo there. If I move my logo around, you'll notice that does not move the mask around with it. So if you need to precisely place this in a certain area, then do that and then pre-compose it. So I'm just going to call this logo say move all attributes and click OK. And now the mask will be positioned precisely where that logo is. Now if I switch this back to final output, we'll notice that there is less grain in that area where my logo was. And it'll be more obvious if I turn the amount all the way up to 100% and maybe make that intensity of the grain a little bit more extreme just so we can see that where my logo was is now not getting that grain applied. And we can choose intensity, alpha, inverted intensity, or inverted alpha as our masking mode for that logo. So with intensity, it's taking brightness values from those colors, or I could change it to alpha and we'll just take a look at that alpha channel. We could also say if mask sizes differ to center or stretch to fit. So if I undo back to before I pre-compose my logo, 
and I change that mode to stretch to fit, then it's just going to take that mask and stretch it to fit the same size as the source layer. In this case, 1920 by 1080. That's generally not something I would wanna do though. But those are all of the controls for add grain. It's a very complex effect with lots of customization potential, but honestly, just choosing one of these presets usually does a really great job. That's it for add grain. Fortunately, a lot of the controls for match grain and remove grain are identical, so we won't have to cover all of them. But for match grain, I've prepared this classic clip of a cowboy shooting at the camera. It's very old footage. Obviously, it was shot on film, probably cranked by hand, but there's a lot of noise and grain in this image. So let's say that I wanted to add in some text. I'll just say Wild West and we'll position it right about here. And clearly this doesn't look like it was on the same footage. It's a clean vector piece of text just composited on top of this old footage. But if I go to the match grain effect and apply it to that text, I'm again going to get a very familiar interface. First, the viewing mode is set to preview. I'm gonna change that to final output, and we're gonna get this really crazy looking grain. But that's not very accurate because I need to first choose a noise source layer. This is where the effect is going to sample noise and then try to emulate it on top of the layer that you're applying it to. So I'm gonna choose this footage and then play back. It's not immediately noticeable. But if I increase this value right here, compensate for existing noise, it's going to basically make it a little bit more intense. So I don't even have to do very much. Maybe a value of two or 4% would be enough to start to see that noise appear on top of that text. And just with the default settings, it's doing a pretty decent job. Now, I don't need to review the preview region settings. These are exactly the same as add grain. And under the tweaking settings, we have a lot of the same controls. Instead of compensate for existing noise, I could increase the intensity of the grain just by increasing this value and maybe turning up the compensate for original a little bit more. I could turn the size up or down, adjust softness, aspect ratio, as well as tweak individual channel intensities and sizes. The color options are exactly the same, as well as the application settings, but the sampling controls is a new section. This is where we're able to tell the effect what parts of the image we want to actually sample the noise from. If I change my viewing mode from final output to noise samples, all of these white boxes are the parts of the footage that it's sampling to generate a noise profile. Now this can be done automatically by default and we can choose a source frame for it to generate the noise profile from. So as I scrub through here, you can see it's only sampling one frame, but let's say that I go forward a little bit. Now it's choosing different parts of the image to sample from. We could also increase or decrease the sample size based on the amount of free space that we have for these samples. But I could also change this from automatic to manual, which will allow me to move each one of these noise sample points individually. So I could reposition all of eight of these boxes and then just grab them and say, I wanna choose noise that's happening on the background, not on the subject, and try and emulate that with this effect. So I'm just gonna position these eight around the frame on the background and then switch this back to final output and see if it changed at all. Now we're getting a lot more color noise. So I might wanna go into color and say, actually, I want this to be monochromatic. I could also go back into tweaking and turn that intensity down a little bit and maybe the compensate for existing noise down a little bit. And now we're getting something that I think is a little bit more accurate. Obviously, this is something that you can play around with to your own taste to make it look however stylized you want it to be. But this is a really quick and easy way to be able to try and match grain with graphics on top of existing footage. We also have the same animation controls as well as the blend with original controls. So the exact same level of customization as the add grain effect. But that's it for match grain. Remove grain, I'm gonna use this same example, attempts to reduce the amount of grain in the image. So I'm gonna drag remove grain out onto this clip again. The viewing mode is set to preview once again, but I'm gonna change this to final output and then just disable and enable this effect with being zoomed in. You'll see that right away, it's removing some of that compression artifacts. Not so much film grain because this footage is low resolution. You can't really see any film grain in it but it is doing a good job of smoothing out those compression artifacts. And most of these controls are identical once again. I could change this to just viewing the noise samples, which is exactly the same as match grain. If I go into sampling, we can leave this at automatic, change it to manual and completely customize this. We can go to the blending mat view to isolate parts of the image to use this effect with, but I'll leave that at final output and we'll walk through the other controls. Under noise reduction settings, we have a value for the amount of noise reduction. So I could turn it down if I think it's a little too intense 
or increase it if I wanted to remove even more. I'll reset that back down to one. We have number of passes. So this is how many times it's going through and attempting to remove that grain. So if I turn this down to one, it will have less grain removal. If I increase it, it will be much more. Let me reset that back to three. We can also change the mode from multi-channel to single channel, which means that it's going to attempt to remove the grain on each color channel individually, red, green, and blue, leaving it on multi-channel, all of the grain uniformly. But we can also adjust the red, green, and blue noise reduction independently right here. Next, we have fine tuning, which allows us to adjust the chroma suppression, which is more useful for reducing color noise. This is black and white footage, so we're not really gonna see much of a difference here, but give that a shot if you're dealing with color noise. Texture is kind of like an intensity slider. The higher the number is, the more fine details are going to be preserved, and the lower you put this, the more washed out and muddied your image will look. Noise size bias controls how the effect is responding to different sizes of noise within the same footage. If I leave it at zero, then it's going to treat all of the noise in the image equally, regardless if there's larger noise in certain sections and smaller noise in others. If I turn this to a negative number, it's going to leave the larger noise and work on just the smaller noise. And if I go to a positive number, it will do the opposite. Clean solid areas is basically going to smooth out similar pixels. So the higher I increase that, you can see that we're getting a much smoother image, but it's really reducing the amount of detail overall. I'll reset that to its default, and then we can go to the temporal filtering section. If I turn that on, this is going to respond to movement within your footage. And you really just have to play around with these settings for your particular clip. Mine is on a tripod, so there isn't a lot of movement, so we're really not gonna see any difference with this turned on. I'm gonna turn that back off and go to the next section, which is unsharp mask. This is exactly the same as the unsharp mask effect, so I could turn the amount up, turn the radius up a little bit, and this is helpful for if you're really smoothing out your image a lot and you're losing some of those details. As you can see, with that amount set to zero and then back up to almost a value of one, it's really giving a lot more definition to the edges of areas with high contrast. Next, we have sampling. This is identical to match grain and add grain, and then finally blend with original, also identical. With that, we've covered all of the properties for all three effects. If you understand how to use one, you pretty much understand how to use all three with a few select additional controls. Each is really useful for doing exactly what they're supposed to do, so you should definitely try using them and see how you can incorporate them into your own workflow. But that's everything you need to know about add grain, match grain, and remove grain. Hey, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this tutorial, then check out the other ones here on my YouTube channel. And if you like my teaching style, then definitely check out my longer form content on Skillshare and School of Motion. And if you want to support more tutorials like this one, check out my Patreon. You can find links for all that stuff in the description of this video.